Jews represent two tenths of a percent of the world's population. If you put a thousand people in a room, there would only be two of them who are Jewish. And yet Jews uh, represent 54% of the world's chess champions. They represent 25% of the Ivy League students. How do you explain this phenomenon? Is it religious? Is it cultural? Is What's the basis for this? It's a function of culture. It's a function of a dispersed people who needed to acclimatize and accommodate often to some of the most difficult jobs because there were up until a few decades ago tremendous restrictions on what Jews could do, what professions they would be allowed into. So there's been a tremendous emphasis on education and a tremendous uh, understanding that uh, the one way out of a, a ghettoized situation was through learning. So I think that's a very strong cultural factor uh, that I can certainly understand well. Uh, I couldn't get into any of the other uh, issues because I'm really not qualified to comment, but to me it's, it's, it's culture and it's um, a tremendous uh, drive for success, which uh, in past generations was also a ticket to survival. Describe to me, in your case, you're an extremely accomplished international attorney you represented the top political prisoners in the world, like Khodorkovsky. You have um, represented the opposition leaders, like uh, Nasser al Rafai and um, the opposition leader in, in Singapore. You, you've had some really incredible experiences and been very successful as an attorney. What drove you to success? What were the factors? I think the driver uh, for myself, for my partner, and frankly for hundreds of lawyers I know has always been uh, intellectual uh, interests and uh, following, uh, if you will, one's heart in terms of trying to make a difference and at the same time uh, create a, an economic basis for survival. So I think uh, it's been uh, also a bit of luck. Uh, with me, I had a father who was uh, extraordinarily interested in me getting out into the world and uh, I was very fortunate that he helped finance some of my early travels when I was 16 I was in Russia and uh, uh, Eastern Europe and Africa and uh, in fact spent a lot of time there uh, in fact contrary to many of the cultural uh, beliefs about education his view was that education was best uh, experienced as opposed to in school uh, and in fact, uh, I, I spent a period of time uh, not in school, as, as what one would term my high school dropout, and uh, traveled uh, in many difficult countries that today we call emerging markets. Uh, then they had, uh, uh, they were just in the first post-colonial flush, and I got a chance to witness uh, the hopes and dreams of, of many uh, people, and then some of the nightmares. I was in Nigeria after the Biafran War, um, and, and I'm a big believer that uh, uh, your ability to understand foreign cultures is something that should be acquired early in life. So that your success was really uh, driven in part by your father's interest in you, by your, your, your travel and learning, and um, it doesn't quite fit into the sort of the, what he describes as, as the high priority placed on education because yours, you postponed yours for a while but got it anyway, right? I mean, you, you Well, in fact, I graduated. Uh, I, w I was a lawyer by the time I was 22. So I managed to um, uh, skip a number of years. Uh, so I, I didn't postpone it much, but... Uh, my family and, and I at the time were, was quite politically active and there was a tremendous political consciousness uh, in the family, in the house uh, that I think in the end served me well in terms of instilling not only knowledge and interest but this drive to try to make a difference. Did anybody in your family actually say to you try to make a difference Bob? I mean how was that put 
to you as a, as no, a young man? No, I, I think the, uh, the genesis of it was uh, learning firsthand from my mother the uh, tremendous uh, travails uh, that anti-Semitism had left uh, the family, the, uh, having her read letters from her parents from Auschwitz, uh, understanding the tenuous grasp the Jewish people have always had on uh, survival and uh, uh, never taking it for granted. So I think that uh, while she didn't experience the Holocaust because she got out in 39, the Holocaust lived with our family till her dying day. Do you think that today, um, because of intermarriage, because of the lower birth rate in the Jewish population, that we're going to see a decrease in this sense of, you know, we, we, we can be the best, you know, be the best at what you can, or in the Jewish population? Well, I, I, I don't, I, I never have thought, I never heard, heard about, you know, any attempt to be the best. I think it was always be, the, be what you can be. And uh, the drive was not so much a competitive drive as this understanding of the challenges that face you. Uh, and certainly, I think, we live in an age today of greater anti-Semitism than we've seen since the war. I, I've, I can't even believe how serious the anti-Semitism is in, uh, in Europe and uh, in England today. Do you face it yourself? Uh, well, I don't know that I face it. It certainly has not been a barrier to me. But do I see it? Uh, absolutely. Everywhere. Yeah, I mean, in Russia, it's, uh, it's a matter that's uh, uh, discussed in social conversations. I mean, uh, it's, uh, and yet it's a different type of anti-Semitism because, as, as you know, if you study Russia, uh, Jews on a business basis have done extraordinarily well in Russia. There's just a consciousness of uh, Jews and a separateness about Jews in Russia that's uh, impactful. Um, I think in Eastern Europe, uh, this is 2010, in the Czech Republic, we've seen a leader, one of the major political parties, resign because of anti-Semitic comments about a prime minister. In Hungary, we've seen a Nazi party achieve 14% of the vote. Uh, you know, these are huge facts that are going on on the ground today as we sit here. Where do you see this leading? Look, I, I have uh, no uh, crystal ball on this, but I can simply tell you that uh, we are living in a time of anti-Semitism that certainly could lead anywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say the same thing about, uh, you know, anti-Semitism also includes Muslims. And I think that in England today uh, and in Europe today, uh, there's a tremendous level of otherness being perpetrated against the Muslim population. And, and uh, I have no idea uh, where that will lead, and I don't think that gets fully expressed. Uh, and I think that we as Jews need to be incredibly sympathetic to uh, Muslim populations who are... As far as the anti-Semitism is concerned, do you have any sense of what has sparked that? It's a mixture. Um, it's become okay for the new left or the left to engage in very strong anti-Israeli uh, attacks which morph occasionally into anti-Semitism. Uh, the rapidness of the anti-Israel lobby uh, at times can be frightening. I mean, in England today, uh, the labor unions like Unite are wildly anti-Israel, sponsoring boycotts, sponsoring all sorts of economic sanctions. Um, and as I said, that line about uh, Judaism and anti-Israel feelings is delicate. Uh, we have the specter in Sweden of the city of Malmo, which has become uh, almost a center of anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, Jews are leaving Malmo. Uh, there's a, a lot on the horizon that's pretty shocking. 
Well, we will follow this with you, and we hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Thank you very much. Bye, Amsterdam.